How's everybody doing? I'm ready to preach if you're ready to get into it today, but I'm not going to preach by myself. I need your help as we're doing a message series on the book of Esther. A lot of you don't even know, or many of you probably don't even have heard of the book of Esther. In fact, it was, it was a book in the Bible that didn't get much attention until they came out with a movie a few years ago. And it didn't get much attention because a lot of people say, well, how does it fit? As we talked about last week, that God is not even mentioned in the story. There's no prayers in the story. Yet we're taking 10 weeks to just sit and dwell and reflect on the book of Esther because you're gonna see, just as we saw last week, that when you think that God is not even present, he is here with you. God is with you all the time, amen? And even when you don't feel him, you don't hear him, and you think he is silent, he is still present. And so this week, we're gonna finish out chapter one. We just took the first nine verses last week, and if you missed it, you should go back and listen to it on YouTube. It's on Facebook. But at the same time, we're going to finish out, and we're going to dwell in the very first part in verse 10 through 12. And so open up to the book of Esther. It's on the screen as well if you don't know where it is in your Bibles, but there's an index in the front. You can find it. The book of Esther is in the Old Testament. And here in verse 10 through 12, it says this. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was high spirits from wine. So what it's saying is that King Xerxes has drank too much. King Xerxes has overindulged. Now, a lot of people will say, Pastor Chris, is it is it a sin to drink? And I'll say, no, it's not a sin to drink. Jesus' first miracle was to turn water into wine. It was a celebration. It was often seen as a blessing. But what we find in the Bible is overindulgence, drunkenness becomes a sin because people make very poor choices. We're going to see that King Xerxes made some very poor choices. And so it says, on the seventh day when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine... He commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahaman, Bitha, Harbona, Bitha, Abitha, Zethar, and Carcass. By the way, if you can't say the words of the Bible, it's okay. Just say it with confidence and say it very fast. Nobody will know the difference. (laughs) So you just get through the names, okay? And it says, obviously he told his seven eunuchs to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the peoples and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's commands, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. We just pray with me? Father God, we come before you today, and I ask as we open up your word, as we read your scriptures, Lord, would you speak to our minds and to our hearts. Father, may these not be the words of my mouth, but the words that you put before us from your living word, the Bible. And may it transform us and change us. May we walk out of here different. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so I wanna talk to you very first about Xerxes overindulging in wine. And what he does is he calls his wife. He calls his wife together and he says, go get my wife. My wife is lovely to look at. She is beautiful. Now, let me remind you, if you were here last week or if you weren't, let me just catch you up, that King Xerxes was the most powerful ruler in that day and age. He was the most powerful ruler of the world. In fact, he owned all the territories. His dad had conquered everything everything. He had about 3 million square miles. Just to give you a kind of a perception is he ruled an area about the size of the United States of America. And this was his kingdom. And King Xerxes was handed this from his father. And he thought, you know what, I'm going to show off my wealth. So he showed off his wealth by having a six month 
party. Can you just imagine having a birthday party for six months or a feast for six months? And it wasn't just six months of, of just getting together. No, these people slept over there in the palace, there in the castle. He sat on his throne for six months drinking wine nonstop. And then after that said, you know what? Let's invite some more people in for a whole week. He invited everybody in to see how much wealth he had. They came in, they got a gold goblet to drink from. It's not like they got a first impressions water mug from TSC when you came here. No, they got a gold goblet. They sat in gold chairs and it was all you can eat, all inclusive paid resort. And they could drink as much as they want. And what it says is King Xerxes at one point overindulged. And when he had overindulged, he said, you know what? He tells his eunuchs, go get my wife. She's pretty to look at. Go, go get, I can just imagine he's probably slobbering and drooling halfway off of his throne. And he's saying, go get Vashti. And his servants go down and tell his wife, who many commentators say, maybe she was underdressed or he was calling her to wear nothing at all because he wanted to parade her beauty in front of all of his soldiers, all of his armies. He had 10,000 Men who were called just around him the immortals because they were willing to give their life for his. You weren't allowed to go before the king's throne without being put to death. You weren't allowed to sit on his throne unless you would be executed. If you would just step on the rug before his throne, you could die without his permission. And so he says, go get Queen Vashti to show her to all of my officials. I want them to see how beautiful she is. She is a trophy wife. Now, she probably wasn't his only wife. In fact, he had a whole harem of women. If it wasn't wives, it was concubines. Some of them he had collected from other people he had conquered where the king would say, here, here's my daughter as your wife. And it was a political value. It was a political agenda where he would marry her and then their kingdom would become his kingdom. And so they would be, the, the father would in a sense become a king, but he would be part of King Xerxes' kingdom as like maybe a royal official or someone higher up because he knew eventually he would get conquered anyway. So he'd say, here, take my daughter as your wife. And so many of these women wouldn't even see their husband maybe once in the whole lifetime. They would see Xerxes. Some of them he collected because they were beautiful. And obviously Vashti was one of these beautiful ones that he just loved to look at in one of his drunken slumbers. What we see in this story is that we talked last week and I wanna show you that the world is broken. This kingdom is broken. What I titled this message today is the world is broken. When the world is broken, what do we do when the world is broken? Someone came to me this last week and said, Pastor Chris, why do all the bad things happen? And they started to name famine and they started to name people hurting and disease. And why does God allow all these things to happen? They said, if God is really sovereign, if he's really in control of all things, why do bad things happen? They were asking me. They said, because when some of these bad things happen, I have trouble explaining to my friends that God is still good. Like we were singing here on stage. That God is good all the time and all the time God is. But I have trouble saying that when bad things happen, when, when mass murders happen, when shootouts happen, when things and people are saying, why, where is God in all of this? And I, want, I told them, it's because the world is broken. Genesis 1 and 2, God created all things good, but in Genesis 3, the fall happened and the world is broken. And the thing is, when we take God out of the mix, you see, the, the book of Esther is about God being silent, that God is not mentioned, that God is absent. And when we take God out of the mix, we see the suffering and the brokenness that takes place. The suffering and the brokenness, when we take God out of schools, when we take God out of society, when we take God out of our lives, we experience brokenness. That's what Genesis 3 is all about. When you remove God, 
we see that the world becomes very broken. When we remove them out of the story of Esther, we see that the kingdom is very broken. Look at what they're doing. They're giving in to all of their lusts, all of their temptations. In verse number 10, it says that on the seventh day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits of wine, there's no discipline. At this point, you can consume all you want. For six months, they're partying, giving in to every single desire they have. As much food as they want, as much drink as they want, as much women as they want. It's just an all out, unleashed, unhinged party. You can just imagine it's the worst of the worst. There's feeding, there's sexual temptation, there's drunkenness. He's saying, let me bring my wife in front of all these men to show off her beauty. Now, if you were a woman, would you like to be stripped down naked before all of your husband's friends and be paraded around? Not having the choice, not having the ability to even say no. In this story, there's power, there's money, There's all of these things. And when we remove God from the story is when we experience the brokenness of this world. You see, King King, King Xerxes didn't even just care about these women. He wanted to be the only man for these women. Notice what it says here in these first two verses His men, the seven eunuchs who served him, he called to go get his wife. Now, if you don't know what a eunuch is, a eunuch is a person who was castrated. King Xerxes said, if these men are going to work in the harem, some of these women he had only seen once, some of these women he didn't care about, some of these women he had just collected as trophies and they'd just been there, but because... They worked with the harem. They, were, they belonged to King Xerxes. King Xerxes isn't going to share. King Xerxes isn't going to let them remarry. King Xerxes isn't going to let them find love. So instead, he says, I'm their, husb- I'm, his, I'm their husband. They belong to me. They're possessions to me. He looks at women as possessions instead of out of love. And so if you worked in the harem, he didn't want these men to be attracted to these women, and he certainly didn't want these women to be attracted to these men. So what did he do? He castrated them. If you worked with the women, you had to be castrated because they belonged to the king. And so what we see here is that we don't just see that King Xerxes is in love with power and money and drinking and showing off his wealth. He also wants to have everything for himself. And when we remove love out of relationships, when we remove love out of people's lives, they experience, again, emptiness and brokenness and suffering because we've removed the love relationships. We've removed marriage out of them. And that's ultimately what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to remove relationships. Satan wants to break down the family. That's his goal. That's his mission. And so if he can mess with you, if he can mess with your family, if he can mess with your marriage, he knows he can bring down the kids. He can destroy the impact you're going to make. He can bring it all down. And so he, again, he attacks the marriage. And he attacks, and we, what we see is we, he, the same way King Xerxes removed the men out of the equation by castrating them is the same way Satan continues to castrate the men in the church today. I, I don't know if you're hearing me yet, but we have an absence of men who are rising up to be spiritual leaders in their houses. There is an absence of parenting who are stepping forward, who says we are going to open up God's word and we're going to see what God has to say today. There is an absence of God in the homes. There is an absence of God in our schools. There is an absence of God in our society, in our community. And people are experiencing brokenness because God is absent. 
I don't think you're hearing me yet. It's not that God is really absent. It's that we've removed him from our daily lives. We've removed him from our households. We've removed him from our families. And the same way that King Xerxes says, it's an all out freak show. It's an all out party. It's an all out sinful, nasty event. Is because he's decided that he's going to remove God outside of his kingdom. And when we see that God is not present in our house today, marriages and people more than ever before are experiencing brokenness. They're experiencing brokenness. He decides to have a banquet. He decides to feed. So I got some things. What causes the world to be broken? There's a story of a young man, and I've, I've, I've said this story maybe once or twice before, but I love it so much. It's, it's, it's a young person who looks at the chief of his village, and he looks at his chief, and, and he says, Chief, why is it that I struggle with anger within me? And the chief looks at him, and he says to the young boy, he says, Listen, I want you to know that there's two wolves that are fighting all the time inside of you. One wolf has anger and jealousy and vengeance, brutality, sinfulness. The other wolf is full of joy and peace and kindness and love and empathy. Young boy looks at the chief and says, which wolf will win? The chief looks at him and says, the one that you feed. The one that you feed will win in the end. What we see is, why is the world broken? What causes the world to be broken? I got three points if you want to write these down from Scripture. Three points if you're taking notes. And number one is, they are feeding their own desires. They are feeding their own desires. Look at the indulgence or the overindulgence. It's not, again, that wine is bad. It's the overindulgence that I don't have enough. I need to consume more and more and more because it's just never enough. It's an overindulgence and power of food, of lust, of desires. He says, let's bring Queen Vashti before all of my men. I can just see the men getting excited. Yes, bring us Queen Vashti. Some of you say, well, what's wrong with that? Some of you young men probably in here or online are saying, what's wrong with that? Why can't we look at swimsuit models? Why can't we go to the, these parades? Can't we see these Miss America pageants? They, they come before us. Isn't it the same thing? We got Miss Persia here. We got Miss Beauty here. We got Vashti, yes. Some of us, have traded our own sinful desires and lusts online and digital, and just because nobody knows about it, we think it's okay. You see, they're feeding their own temptations, their own desires. We're gonna overindulge. Even Paul says, he says, not everything is beneficial. Overindulge is not beneficial. Even good things, when we overindulge, are not beneficial for us. Somebody who has too much sweets, you know at the end of the day, you're going to get a bellyache. Somebody who decides, decides to continually eat, desserts are good once in a while. But an overindulgence of it will make you sick. And they continue to feed their own evil desires, their temptations. Which wolf will win in the end? The one that you decide to feed. Number two, they are feeding off each other. They're not just feeding their own sinful desires, but they decide to feed off each other. Look at what it says as we scroll down to verses 14 through 20. And it says, since it was customary for the king to consult experts of the matters of the law of justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Kershima, Shethnar, Amatha, Tarshish, Mirs, Mesina, and Mukaman, the seven nobles of Persia of Media who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. 
Then Mukama replied the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. So he says, listen, she hasn't just betrayed the king, but she's betrayed us too. Well, how has she betrayed you, Mukaman? How has she said no to you? Well, look at what it says. It says, for the queen's conduct, will become known to all the women. And they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of nobility who have earned, heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases king, let him issue a royal decree. And let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. And also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Somebody who obeys. Somebody who listens. Somebody who doesn't mind being a trophy wife. Also, let the king give her royal position to somebody else. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all of his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. And so they're feeding off each other because the noble men are given the king's advice. And they're like, king, listen, if your wife doesn't respect you, it's not too long before our wives don't respect us. If your wife tells you no, it's not going to be too long until our wives tell us no. She refuses to come, then you need to banish her, king. You need to get rid of her. You need to replace her. You need to throw her out like old trash and get somebody who actually listens because our wives need to obey us. You see, when they're overindulged in wine, they don't have anything positive. They're just like, listen, it's got to benefit us. It's selfish. They're saying, if it doesn't work for us, if our family's not working for us, let's find somebody new. Let's find somebody so it all works for my benefit. It's not about love. It's not about care. It's not about marriage. It's about obedience. If she's not going to listen to you, then she's going to lead our wives astray too. And we don't want our wives to tell us no. So you need to replace her with somebody who shows obedience. They're feeding off each other. And what's interesting to me is sometimes we do the same thing. We feed off each other as well. Something doesn't go your way, what do you do? You get together with a group of people that agree with you and you start to talk about it, right? So sometimes we call this gossip and we find people that actually agree with our opinion and we corral them and, and they start to fire us up. Because we start to think about it and we start to dwell about it and we start to think, yeah, they wronged me. That hurt. And let me tell them. And we start to build a case. You see, we build a case against each other. It's easy to build a case. It, it's so easy to put together a case. You can be sitting there saying, you know what? Queen Vashti, she didn't come to me. I'm the king. She needs to obey I sit on the throne. I give her all the power in the world. I'm her husband. She needs to listen. If she doesn't listen to me, she's going to bring all these other wives to revolt against their husbands, and then the, the throne's going to revolt, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose the control that I have. I'm the peacekeeper. I'm the God of this realm. Xerxes saw himself as a literal God before the people. They referred to him as the son of God, if that sounds familiar. And so Xerxes is like, if they all, my, my kingdom could go crumbling down because of this one individual and this one act. And so we like to build a case and when we build a case, people begin to rile us up. And we build this case against each other and Satan gets in the mix because Satan, he's not just a deceiver. He's a masterful deceiver that gets you to even deceive yourself. He gets you to believe in the lies and the, the deceits where you even will deceive yourself. Satan's not only a liar, but he's masterful on getting you to lie to yourself. If our wives tell us no, then everything's gonna come crumbling down. 
And so they begin to play off each other. Instead of going to the person and having a conversation, we build a case against them. We get all these people that begin to agree with us. And it goes against the word of God. Number three, they begin to feed their own thoughts. They begin to feed their own thoughts. Look at what it says here in Esther 1, verses 21 and 22. They are feeding their own thoughts. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as Mumaken proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in their own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his household using his native tongue. This is a decree, an edict, a word from the king or the word from their God saying it cannot be taken away. Vashti can no longer come before any of us. Vashti is banished. Vashti is gone. And every single woman needs to listen to her husband. It's a decree given by the king. And what amazes me here is that God is replaced with a man. A man sits on the throne, not Jesus. A man is declaring his decree seen as God before the people instead of the God of the Bible. God is strangely absent here, but the word of Xerxes is seen as authority, a decree, an edict over the word of God. I, I love the boldness of Vashti because Vashti actually has the ability and the bravery to say no. Many of you can debate this week in your power groups and wonder, is Vashti saying no because she's a believer? Is Vashti saying no because it's a moral thing? Or is Vashti saying no because she's like, I'm not gonna parade around naked in front of all your friends. There's no way that I'm gonna do that. Regardless of the reason why Vashti said no. Did she feel like it was immoral to do that? Vashti most likely wasn't a Christian, a believer, or, or a person that even knew the Jewish God. So why would she say no? That's a great question to ask in your power groups this week. Why did Vashti say no? But what I love about it is that she stood for what is right. No, I'm not gonna stand and pray myself so are your friends to lust over me. No, I'm not gonna go out and reveal my naked body to them. No, I'm not gonna go give in to your command when you summon me drunk. I don't care if you're the king or not. She was brave and she was noble and she did what was good and right. She said, no. It's a word that some of us need to hear more often. It's a word some of us need to say more often. You see, God says no. Parents say no. And we need to learn to say no and say yes to God and no to the ways of the world. Let me say that again because I didn't get a good response on that. I'm preaching by myself. We need to learn to say yes to God's word and no to the ways of the world. Xerxes represents the ways of the world. Drunkenness, overindulgence, and it leads to brokenness and emptiness. And we need to learn to say no. We need to learn to discipline ourselves. That's what discipleship is all about. It's discipline. When you say no to a child who's going to touch a hot stove, what are you saying? You're saying no because I love you. I don't want you to burn yourself. I don't want you to have a third degree burn. When you say no, I don't want you playing out in the streets because I don't want you to get hit by a car because I love you and cherish you and want to continue to spend time with you. You're my loved one. You're my child. When God tells you no, it's for your own benefit. When God tells you no, it's for a good reason. He loves you. He cherishes you. And we need to learn to say no, just like a good parent would say no to us. Saying no can be loving. Often it is loving. The difference between authority, you might say, well, Pastor Chris, doesn't it mean that when she, that in Ephesians, it says that a woman's supposed to submit to her husband? She didn't submit. Sometimes when we say yes and we don't say no because ultimately God has the ultimate authority and a husband 
has just had borrowed authority. It's the difference between innate authority and derivative authority. But if you don't know what that means, what it's saying is that God has the ultimate authority and a husband on this earth has borrowed authority from God. And if he's willing to do something sinful, he's going to continue to practice sinful ways. Sometimes as a spouse, you have authority to follow God instead of your husband. Because if he's gonna try to lead you astray, if he's gonna try to lead you into sinfulness, you gotta honor your Lord first before you honor the man here on earth. Some people are following along online and you have a boyfriend right now that's trying to lead you astray. You need to follow God's word instead of what this boy is putting in your head. And I'm telling you right now, if he's trying to lead you astray, you dump him. You break up with him. If he's your husband, you just tell him no. But if he's your boyfriend, break up with him now because he's trying to lead you astray. We have a God who has the authority in heaven. Amen. And ultimately, if... If someone's going to respect their husband, their husband needs to be respectable. Their husband needs to be willing to lead in order for someone to want to follow. That's what leaders do. They lead, they lead the household, they lead their kids. And we need some leaders in the church today, amen? We need some leaders in our society that rise up, some Christians who are willing to say no to wrong. And yes to God. There's a difference in authorities. Xerxes doesn't respect women. Xerxes doesn't care. And they're feeding their own thoughts. We got to ask ourselves this question. How am I Xerxes? How am I Xerxes in this story? What is it that I overindulge in? What is it that I'm selfish in? What is it that I want for myself? What is it that I care about? Who is it that I'm willing to listen to my own thoughts? You see, when we remove God from it, we break the world. But I've got three points for you on how to redeem the world. It's the three opposite points from here. And number one, it says, we need to learn to say no to the world. We call that discipline. We call that discipline. You see, even God said no to Paul. Paul prayed to God. And sometimes God says no. He says yes, he says no, and sometimes he says wait. And here in 2 Corinthians, he said no to Paul. Paul says, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, because Paul knew he was a prideful person. Paul was intelligent beyond all means. Many of us wish we could be like Paul. Have his bravery, have his courage, go into cities and start churches. He would get stoned and he would get back up and walk back in and say, oh no, I'm going to tell you how, how my God is. And he would begin to preach again. Some of us wish we were brave like Paul. Paul says, because I would have become conceited. I would have become prideful. In order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what this thorn is. We don't know if it was an ailment, if it was a sickness, if it was a limp. Some people think it was a limp. But it says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in your weakness. You see, it's only when we're weak that we look for God. It's only when we're weak that we're willing to actually look up. It's only in our weaknesses that we can see that God is powerful and strong and will get us through. When we believe that we can't do it on our own, he says, I am here for you and I am here with you. All you do is have to lean on me. He says, cast all your burdens onto me and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will make you whole. I will give you shalom. You see, it's in our weaknesses that God works through us and in us to show us his strength. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. It's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's about what he can do through you. Amen? We got to learn to say no. And that's when we discipline ourselves. That's what fasting is all about. We say no to food and we pray. 
Because why? You're disciplining yourself that my body's not in control of me. God, you're in control of me. My appetite's not in control of me. I might be hungry, but I'm saying no to this because I'm going to spend more time in prayer. You see, we say no to things in order to train and teach our body. That's what conditioning is all about. When you go to the gym, you're training, you're conditioning, you're discipling, you're disciplining yourself. When you say no to certain things, we got to learn to say no to the ways of the world in order to say yes to God. That's what sanctification is all about. It's about discipline, discipling, saying no. Number two, we need to learn to repent. Apologize. You see, King Xerxes, when Vashti said no to him, did he go to her and say, sweetheart, I'm sorry. Baby, I'm sorry for trying to make you parade around. You know what? I, I, I had a stupid night. I drank too much. I did it again. I'm sorry, baby. Will you forgive me? No, King Xerxes doesn't do that. No, he listens to his friends about banishing his wife and replacing her because he doesn't listen. He doesn't respect her. We need to learn to repent. Repentance means I was walking one direction and I turned around 180 degrees and I went back. Repentance means humbling ourselves and saying, I'm sorry. Repentance means I'm not going to continue to go this direction. I'm going to choose to go this direction. And what we learn in this story is that a man did not respect his wife. He didn't care about his wife. He didn't cherish his wife. Yet the Bible tells us in Ephesians 5 how to have a great marriage. It tells the women, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands. We hate that verse, don't we, women? I mean, I, I know women tell me, I hate that. I wish I cut that right out of the Bible. But listen to it. We learn to mutually submit to one another because there's a command for the women, but there's also a command for the guys. And it says, women, submit to your husbands. As you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. What it's saying is, you should follow your husband if he's being a good leader. Just like Christ is the head of the church, your husband should be leading your house where you want to follow him. Because the next command is a command of the husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. Well, what does love look like? Sacrificial, caring. It's what Jesus did for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world that he was willing to give his son on the cross in death to go to hell in order to save you and me. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves the world, to love the person means to sacrifice, to give of yourself, to die of yourself in order for them to live. That's what we call love. To say, it's not my way. I want you to be happy. That's love. And so to love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. Look how beautiful this is. Without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. He was willing to die for the church. He was willing to redeem the church. The church was stained with sin and stained. It was disgusting. But Christ's blood washed over and made it clean. Christ's blood unwrinkled it and straightened it all out. Christ's blood, but his blood is his sacrifice. His blood means his death. His blood means that he was willing to go to hell for you and me. That's what love is. When you love somebody, it's not based on what they've done. It's based on what you're willing to do for them sacrifice, love. It says, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own body, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but feel and care for their body just as Christ does for the church, for we are members of his body. And number three, we need to put God in the center and back on the throne. We need to put God 
in the center and back on the throne. Esther is a story that again is strangely absence of God. He is silent, he is not mentioned. And what you see is a broken, empty place. And what we as Christians need to put in order to put the world back together, in order to put the pieces back together, in order to redeem the world, in order to redeem people, we need to put God back in the center. He needs to be back in the center of our relationships, our marriages. He needs to be back in the center of our families. He needs to be in the center of our parenting. I can't imagine parenting without God because I wouldn't know what to do. You see, the world says, well, in order to know what to do, we just, we need to look at ourselves. We need to look inward. We know what to do. I tell people all the time, if I'm broken, as a broken sinner, a broken individual, and I look into myself to find out who I am, what am I gonna see? A broken person. If I look in myself, what am I gonna see? A motion of brokenness, because that's who I am. If I look inside myself for my own thoughts, my own mind, I'm gonna see broken thoughts, lustful thoughts, hatred thoughts, jealous thoughts, angry thoughts, because I'm a broken person. Individual, that's what we see with Xerxes. He did not get his way and he became angry. But if we begin to put Jesus back in the center, if we begin to put Jesus back in this place, what do we see? Sacrifice and love and grace and kindness and peace. All the things of the fruits of the Spirit, patience. We need more patience with each other, amen? We need more love, amen? We need more forgiveness, amen? And the only way to have that is to put Christ back in the center and back on the throne. Xerxes goes forward and he says, it is my decree and my word, but we need to put the Bible, we need to put the scripture, we need to put the word of God back in our families and back in our lives, amen? Amen. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy 3. This is Paul's warning to Timothy before he dies. And he writes to Timothy and he says, listen, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. Does it sound like today? Does it sound like 2020 when people were belittling each other over politics? Does it sound like when people were willing to fight and end relationships because they were lovers of their opinion, lovers of what they care about, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having nothing to do with such people. And then he continues on in a couple verses later and he says, but as for you, this is Timothy, this is to the believer in the house, but as for you, but as for you, but as for you, if you believe in Jesus Christ and what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every, say it again, for every, say it with me, for every good work. We need to bring God's word back in the house. We need it to bring it not just in the church, but out there in the world. We can't just have it on Saturday nights or Sunday mornings. We need it Monday through Friday, seven days a week, multiple times a day. We need to be in God's word to put him back on the throne in our lives and put him in control, amen? That's the only way we're gonna bring wholeness and shalom and peace and love to this world. Everything else brings brokenness emptiness and loneliness. 
It's a relationship with Jesus that's going to let you know how much God loves you and cares for you, that he was willing to die for you, sacrifice his own life for you. And when you understand that, you're willing to allow that to spill into your marriages, into your relationships, over onto your kids. You're willing to forgive. You're willing to bring peace. You're willing to lay down your life for them because you have Jesus. And he was willing to lay down his life for you. I'm gonna ask for you to bow your heads as we close in a word of prayer. And if you're following online or maybe you're listening here and you want to say, I've experienced brokenness. I understand now this broken world that we live in is because I have not had a relationship with God. I've experienced loneliness. I've experienced heartbreak. I've experienced disappointment. I've overindulged thinking that this was going to bring me joy and delight and it did for a couple days and then it just left me empty with nothing. And I've tried everything. And I have not found joy. I've not found true contentment. I'm here to tell you that I'm here to offer you the free gift right now. It's through a relationship with Jesus. It's believing in his word. It's believing that he loved you. And Romans 10, 8, and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can experience eternal life. You can experience a divine relationship with God. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to come into your life and make you whole, to make you complete, even in the broken world. He wants to transform you and change you. If that's you today and you want to accept a relationship with Jesus, all you do is have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Just pray this prayer with me. Maybe you've said it once. Maybe you're saying it for the tenth time. Maybe this is your very first time. It doesn't matter. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've experienced brokenness and my sin has brought me brokenness. But Father, I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross for me. And I want to invite him into my life. Father, come into my life and make me whole. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, people are clapping for you. If you're online watching and you prayed for the very first time, people are clapping for you. You know why? Because there's a party in heaven going on right now, amen. The angels are celebrating because somebody who was broken is now restored. A relationship that was divided has been healed. And now there's nothing else to do but stand up and worship the one who brings restoration to all things. He's bringing restoration to the world. He's brought restoration to you. And we get to celebrate and honor him.